when I was reading your biography, I was I was wondering how a kid from Aurora ended up at the Citadel. Not to say that they didn't go there, uh, but especially at that time, you were in high school in the early 70s. And right. the Army's not the most popular place at that time, unless well, it was in your area. So how did I end up there? I am, um, well, you know, I think for most of us, what we do in life has is how we're raised. My father had been a soldier during the Korean War as an infantry sergeant, and he was not, you know, career military or anything, but he'd always spoken well of that. And, you know, the Korean War, he was there in the first year. I mean, it was horrible. He was with the Army units east of the Chosin Reservoir when the Marines made the famous fighting withdrawal. And the Army units there got really chewed up. His company at one point was down to three guys. But, but my father recognized the value of the military. He said, look, you know, I didn't stay in. If you want to do it, fine. When I was growing up, of course, Vietnam War and all that, but but I was in a neighborhood where people went. You know, my my neighbors went. Some of them even volunteered. Some were drafted, but you know, I I never met a person who who resisted the draft or anything like that. That wasn't the neighborhood in the Chicago suburbs I lived in. So um, when we moved to Aurora, which is a little bit further out from Chicago, um, one of the reasons we moved there was there was a good school there that, that was my my family's Roman Catholic. And so they wanted me to go to Catholic high school and they had found this one and it was a military school. But I mean, there's a weird combination, but it was run by these Benedictine priests and out of an abbey in Marmion, Marmion Abbey it's called. And the school was called Marmion Military Academy. And so that's where I went to high school. So for me, at least coming out of high school in the seventies, going into the military was a normal thing. So I, I competed for it and got a army scholarship, ROTC scholarship. I wanted to go to West Point, but I didn't get in. I wasn't, you know, high enough on the pecking order or whatever. But the Citadel took me, and so I could use my scholarship there. So here I go. I'd never, I'd never been in the South at all in my life, and you know, the first day I get down there, I got my Land of Lincoln driver's license and all that. And you know, this this guy comes up to me, you know, in sort of typical sort of boot camp fashion. He goes, "Who won the war?" And I'm thinking to myself, the Vietnam War. I mean, it's still going on. I, no, you know, down there, they only meet one wall. And, uh, and you know, I, I eventually figured out what, why that was a question down there. But uh, anyway, that's how I got there. I, I, I really, and, and we will talk about uh, the Panzer killers, but there's so, I, I almost feel like a, like a, one of your most enthusiastic students who's got office hours and could ask anything he wants, you know? So that's, but I, knew going into uh, reading it that Mark Clark, General Mark Clark was, um, what was the, the superintendent, the commandant, what was the title for? He, by the time I was there, he, he had, um, he was the emeritus. He was the retiree. Of course, he was, he had fought in World War I. Um, and Clark, in fact, his family originally, although they had military connections, was originally from the Chicago area. So, um, I, know, I mean, I'm in Highland Park where, where, General Clark, I believe, was born, if that's correct. That's right. Yeah, right and near the old Fort the Sheridan. Hospital. Yeah, that's right. Fort Sheridan was there and all that. Now it's a wreck area, but um, yeah. So the he... other thing I'll say about the Citadel is um, my father's partner, uh, a, a fellow named, um, well, the, the graduate of the Citadel, it's his brother, his name was Bob Barth. Bob Barth, he still lives, he lives in Los Angeles. Sure. And he told me a great story about... Um, uh, one of the the cadet companies that he was commanding, there was a Jewish kid there that was that complained that he was getting it a little tougher than the other uh, uh, cadets, and so he he made a complaint of anti-Semitism. Little did he know that Bob Barth is Jewish, oh, and from yeah. and from well met. So he always got a kick out of that story. But you know, there's also I also liked how you started the story with. Um, you as a cadet in 1977 being uh, given permission to meet with, with the retired uh, Mark Clark. And they said, what were the three questions that you weren't allowed to ask? Oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Said, said you weren't, you, again, as you know, General Clark, of course, probably his most famous command. He, he had a brief command during the Korean War at the end of the war, sort of one of the guy two or three down the line from MacArthur but um, as the theater commander. But in World War II, his most famous command was 5th Army and then 15th Army Group in Italy. 
So of course, when the, the faculty guys are briefing us cadets, you know, okay, you're going to meet the great man and all that. And he, Clark is a, I mean, he's, he's dead now, but he, I mean, even in his old age, he was clearly this inspirational, charismatic guy. I mean, you came in a room, it was like electricity, you know. Uh, the only other guy I can honestly say I met in the U.S. military like that was General Powell. Colin Powell was like that. If he came in a room, you knew he was in that room, even if you didn't talk to him. So Clark is there and he's in his study with all his, you know, his memorabilia, his weapons and maps and plaques he was given by the British and the Polish and all these other guys. But, they, but the faculty major that was briefing us, who was a Vietnam veteran, by the way, and had been at the Citadel when Clark was the, the superintendent, was the president, was the head guy there before he retired. He says, now look, he says, whatever you talk to General Clark about, you know, don't, don't bring up anything having to do with Casino or Anzio or any of these controversial issues, Salerno. I mean, Clark had a long string of them that were sort of, you know, almost losses that, that were really tough while he was in Italy. And he said, and don't talk to him, don't ask him about his Jewish mother. And we're, we're all looking at each other like, his Jewish mother, you know, he hadn't heard that story. But, um, but anyway, so we go in, we didn't ask any of those questions. And, but, uh, but yeah, it was something to hear him talk. He, I mean, because obviously he was one of the last of the great World War II commanders. In fact, Martin Blumenson, the famous, um, who, by the way, also a great uh, Jewish war veteran, um, and historian. He was the third army historian under Patton, but he'd also worked briefly in, in Italy before the 1944 campaign started. And so Blumenson's last major book he did before he, he passed on was, was a biography of Clark. So Blumenson was actually at um, the Citadel in the Mark Clark archives. Clark is not a Citadel graduate. He's a West Pointer. But in, in the mind of Mark Clark, West Point had never given him the uh, the proper adulation that he thought he deserved. And the Citadel was so happy to get this guy. And, and the Citadel, of course, by background, it's, it's a lot like Virginia Military Institute. It's one of these state military colleges that was formed before the Civil War, frankly, to train officers for the Confederate militia. <laughs> they knew the war was coming and they wanted to have their own guys. They couldn't count on the West Point or some of whom would stay with the North. Um, so the, the, the background of the school is actually based on secession, but the Citadel, like BMI, has tried to put that behind them and become a more national institution. So recruiting a famous fighting general like Mark Clark was, was a big deal for them. And to get him there and, and to have him affiliated with the school. So he bestowed his archives on the school and they're down there to this day. People who study the war in Italy often go there. And Clark also, one other thing I, I just mentioned, you know, you talk about people who don't get their due from history. Clark did a superb job as the occupation authority in Austria. We forget that Austria, you know, was also occupied after the war. And that occupation was so successful that under Nikita Khrushchev, the Russians actually voluntarily ended the occupation. The only agreement they had was Austria had to be neutral. Now they had an ulterior motive. They were hoping we would also neutralize West Germany, but uh, which we didn't. But, but the point was Clark had had a very successful um, time as the occupation authority in Austria. And, um, and again, doesn't really get his due for that because what people remember him for was then Korean War and then he retired and went to Sino. But he was quite a, quite a personality. I watched, I watched the world at war recently. Sure. And, and I was thinking, since it was, was, it was a British production and some of, the, some of the comments that they got from Mark Clark in that film, it didn't make him uh, come off very tolerant or nice because at one point he just says, "I was I was envious of the of the Germans in that they were all of one nationality, and here I was commanding Greeks, Turks, different yeah. kinds of all these units uh, with different dietary rules, and some couldn't couldn't fight on Saturdays or." or Sundays, and, and not to say, I mean, it, it, was, it was a very, it was a comment that I'm sure he would have stood by 100%, but I just thought that, okay, this is a British production. They, they, they took a, a sound bite and they put it in there, but these guys had to contend with so much in what I consider the most overlooked part of World War II. Italy is never talked about. Right. Right. And well, and of course, you mentioned British production, the, the famous World War series, you know, narrated by Sir Lawrence Olivier himself exactly. and all that, you know, who was, as you know, besides being a famous actor, was briefly a pilot in World War II and all that. 
I heard, I mean, the story is he kept cracking up so many training planes. They said, why don't you go act, go back to acting, Sir Lawrence? But uh, he wasn't a sir then, but- uh, David Niven was, was- David Niven, yeah. He was with the commandos for a while, I know, and, and all that. But, and it's just a reminder, I, I think for us of, of how many people were involved, but for the British, Italy was always a big theater because um, that's where General, later Field Marshal Harold Alexander was the theater commander for most of the war. The British always saw it as their theater and um, they knew that in Northwest Europe, an American Ike was gonna command. You know, Ike had originally been the theater commander in Italy. When he transitions to England to get ready for Normandy in early 44, then the British have their theater for six months and, uh, you know, and in their mind, the British covered a lot. It's also very important to the Canadians because their forces also fought there. And all these other groups you mentioned, the Free French were there, the, the, there was a, a Greek contingent, there was a, a Polish contingent, Greek Polish contingent that in fact would be heavily involved in the fighting at Casino. The, um, there, there was a, a, a Jewish contingent that came from Palestine. You know, there were, there, I mean, any organization, the Brazilians the were, yeah, the Brazilians were there. So, I mean, there were entity, you know, as well as all the, all the usual lineup from the British Empire and Dominions, you know, the Canadians, the, the South Africans, the Australians, the New Zealanders, all of them, there, Indian, uh, a tremendous uh, Indian army presence there. So, so it really was quite a, you know, it was like a UN worth of uh, theater there. And, 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 and beautiful when it wasn't being bombed. Oh, yeah. Just, well, and, and both sides had Italians on, you know, I, I know what Clark said, but but the Germans had a fascist Italian government. You know, they sent in Otto Skorzeny and the SS commandos to rescue Mussolini, and they set them up in northern Italy. So there were both sides had Italians fighting on their side, and then the Italians just trying to survive this this conflict that's going on in their in their villages. I'd mentioned Samuel Fuller in one of my my letters. Uh, he he wrote about uh, one of the men in the in the first division in Sicily in his outfit. Um, he, he, he went and looked for his, uh, grandmother and found her, a kid from New wow. York city went to, you know, in right after they went into, uh, Jella, you know, he found, he found his grandmother alive. So, and she had cooked for the whole unit. Yeah. Thank God for that. I mean, oh. sadly, as you know, there was, there were many cases. And in fact, you know, this from your own historical research and documentary work. There were cases of people whose families had emigrated out of Nazi Germany, just you know, as Hitler, the Hitler business started, and they unfortunately, when they when they entered the Reich, found their families had been had been rounded up and killed. Yeah, it's 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 tragic. You know, there is another story of of a man. He's since passed away. He lived in Illinois, and his name was uh, Werner Elman, not Jewish, born in Germany. Parents can't, you know, they brought them to what is now uh, the Lincoln Square area. In, oh, sure. In, which I think they jokingly referred to as the Fourth Reich because there were so many Germans there. And um, Elman's family were Bundists. They were in the Bund, the, uh, the German-American Bund. They moved the family to, back to Germany in 1936 or 37 when Werner was just out of high school. He didn't like it at all. They came back and, you know, uh, long story short, he went back as a GI and was, was there at the liberation of Mauthausen. And wow. he just was so furious, you know, being, you know, the, in closely, even had uh, half brothers that were serving in the Wehrmacht and the SS that he never spoke to again. But he also told me a great story about punching out Mickey Rooney uh, when they were both in um, the special, in one of the service battalions putting on a play or putting on some kind of show, special services. And, um, but no, so there, there are all these stories coming out of Italy. Now, is this when Rose comes, the, the subject of uh, the Panzer Killers comes on the scene and makes a name for himself? Yeah, um, Rose actually, you know, he'd, he had also been in World War One as a junior officer, but he had he had not gone the West Point route. He, in fact, there's a pretty good question um, when you look at the other uh, the the life biography of of uh, Morris Rosen. Stephen Assad's book is is really the one to check there. Marshall Fogel also has got a, a a pretty good account of it with a lot of primary documents. There's a question of if Rose even um, even finished high school. 
You know, some people wonder about that because um, the, the only transcript that we have a photo stat of from, from the Colorado area where, where he was raised, born in Connecticut, and then they moved out west. His dad was, was making clothes and stuff. Um, the, the, the transcript ends his junior year. It's, you know, the grades are great. I mean, I would love to be Morris Rose in high school. I think he could have gone to any college in America at that time, but, mm. but um, it ends. And part of the reason it ended, this was the preparedness movement in World War I. And everybody, you know, much in the news was, well, we're gonna have to fight the, the Kaiser's Germans and we gotta get ready. And, and a lot of people, you know, Teddy Roosevelt, the former president was involved in this, Leonard Wood, the former army chief of staff and Roosevelt's old commander from the, the war against the Spanish in 1898. These guys were beating the drum saying, we gotta get ready. And so young Morris Rose goes and joins the Colorado National Guard. Back then, they didn't check your paperwork too closely because Rose was about, you know, 16 years old. There was no way he should have been inducted. Mm. Um, Dad and mom got involved. He, they said, thank you for your interest in national defense, Rose, but go home and finish high school. That's well, he goes home to finish high school. And then, you know, that year, his junior year, the, the war is declared. Because he's got some military experience in a country with not much he competes for and gets a slot to the officer candidate school at Fort Riley, the, the first big class that produced many of the leaders for, for the World War. And, and Rose goes over and fights in World War I as a young officer. And um, he was wounded in action in the Meuse-Argonne and all that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, he finished the war, came home, the army demobilized, he was released. He, he went into the meat sales business for a while, realized he didn't like that. And, <laughs> and because he had a great service record, they said, hey, we'll take you back. And so even though the army was small, he was able to get in. But unlike Mark Clark or George Patton or Omar Bradley or any of these other guys, Joe Collins, you know, these other famous generals of that era, he was a West Pointer. And in fact, he had no college. So what, he couldn't even, you know, pull out the old school tie and say, well, heck, I went to Northwestern or something. He, he'd, gone, he'd gone to the school of the Western Front. Right. Um, that didn't hurt him. But it also meant that had there not been a World War II, he probably would have topped out at about major. You know, the Great Depression slowed promotions down. But, but he had a good reputation. I mean, he was known as a guy who could get things done. He was known as a non-troublemaker. The interesting thing is it's not clear that any of his peers knew he was a Jewish guy. They didn't know his religion. And, and Rose never denied his family. I mean, he wrote to him regularly. You know, he never... He, he wasn't one of these guys who said, well, I'm going to act like I'm a Christian or whatever. But he would go, you know, he was married twice. His wives were both Christians. He would go to the service with them now and then. But by and large, he just, he didn't participate. And frankly, although they, they would never admit this in their biographies, neither did most of the officers in that period. It was sort of, you know, they were nominal Episcopalians or whatever, you know. Yeah, right. There were a couple of them that were real, real religious, but, you know. I mean, it, might have meant, it might have meant just as very he What's that? Been, he, he very well could have been proud of his heritage, but I think that uh, the belonging and an entree that he had been given into the uh, into a Christian army, into you know an upper rung in society as a as a as an army officer, was probably very appealing. You know, I, I, I'm sure. He yeah, was I, I think that's a very that's a very good way to say it, Steve. And and uh, I don't think he wanted to deny his heritage. I think his his concern was, if I make, you know, th that was a different era. And today the era is always about, you know, you celebrate your heritage, you celebrate your tradition. The era back then was assimilate. And the world, the, what folks like him were assimilating, and this was true for most people who came from immigrant families. You know, his, he was not the immigrant, he was the child of the immigrants. Mm -hmm. But for most case, I mean, everything from, you know, his name had been changed. You know, that was not his family's name um, when they left. What was it? I, I, I'd have to look it up, but I, I believe it was Rosebaum. Okay, okay. And I know, the, I know his mom, her name was anglicized to Brown, and it was, it was not anything close to that. You know? That's fascinating. But, you know, they got, they got the standard, yeah, the yeah. standard Ellis Island. That name's too long. Here's a name. You know, right. go with this. It's, that's, that's, that's great. But, so he comes on the scene. Um, he's a major or a colonel when he, when he first, re he goes to North Africa first. Yeah, well, it's actually before the war. It's the build up to the war. So again, we know, you know, you think back to World War II, 
we didn't know how war was going to come, but but the world had been at war since September 39. So in the United States, President Roosevelt, the Congress, you know, th there was certainly a strong America first isolationist movement. But even people in that movement were saying, ah, we better be ready. We could get bombed. We could get attacked. If nothing else, we got to protect ourselves. So with a lot of reluctance, the United States declared a peacetime draft, began to mobilize industry. That was kind of handy coming out of the Depression, all that. As part of that, Major Morris Rose, who's in the cavalry, like horse cavalry, gets tagged to join one of these new armored divisions. Well, he's not the head guy. Rose is not. He's, he's a bit, but he's, he's an experienced regular army officer. He's gone to all the right schools, command and general staff, war college. So they say, hey, Rose, you're going to be a battalion commander. And while he's a battalion commander, one of the senior army armor commanders, cavalryman George Patton says, hey, I need a chief of staff for the division. Chief of staff, the right-hand man of the, of the division commander, the two-star general, he picks Rose. Mm. And that happened in the States. That happened before, the, you know, before Pearl Harbor. It happened in early 1941. And in fact, Patton then left the division. He got promoted. You know, he, he moved on. But he, the, one of the last things he did was pick Rose as to be the chief of staff. They only worked together directly for about a month, but then of course they were working the war. So as you say, now we go to war, America invades North Africa, you know, Operation Torch supporting the British, Monty and the guys coming from Egypt and the Americans, British, some free French coming from the West through the French colonies there. And now Rose is chief of staff of an armor division. Um, and in that he distinguished himself. I mean, in, in army terms, the chief of staff runs the headquarters. So the second division, correct? Second armored? Yeah, division? in this yeah. case, that's right. Second armored right. division. So, and he's the chief of staff of the second armored division. So Rose actually had served originally in the first armored division. So he was actually one, two, and three at various wow. times, but in combat with the second. So he's the chief of staff. So he's going through North Africa. Now the chief of staff in the army, he runs the headquarters. You know, he keeps the maps posted, make, gets the radio reports, does all that kind of stuff. He's not normally a fighting guy. But Rose, was, Rose had combat experience, um, and Rose thought to do his job, he needed to go up and see what was going on. So he got in multiple fights, I mean, and, and to include accepting the surrender of a major German formation at one point and all that. See, this goes back to Rose's background. Mm -hmm. um, because his family had come from Eastern Europe, in the home, they and a lot of their relatives would speak Yiddish. Well, if you know Yiddish, Yiddish has a lot of German in it. Yes. Nobody understood why Rose could understand the Germans. You know, they were like, well, he's not German, but, you know, but they knew for somehow when you'd send Rose to parley with the Germans, he could make them understand what was going on. You know, Rose had no love for the Germans, to say the least, but, but he could talk to them. So he negotiated the surrender of a German unit. He earned two silver stars, one for bravery and one for that very brave effort to go behind the lines and negotiate that surrender. Patton says, now Patton's now the Corps commander, getting ready to be an army commander and invade Sicily. He says, make Rose a Brigadier General. Oh. And so, so Patton twice, when he made him the, a, a, a Colonel Chief of Staff, bumped him up from Major, Lieutenant Colonel, then all the way to Colonel, full bird. And now he makes him Brigadier General. And in the armor formations, normally Brigadier Generals and Army Divisions, even today, they're deputies. So there's, they're hanging around the headquarters. They get sent out on sort of, hey, you missions. Hey, go solve this, sort out this bridge crossing, whatever. In armor units, this is, you know, Patton and the cavalrymen, they actually commanded. So they commanded combat commands. So when Rose goes into Sicily, he's in command of about half of the division's combat power for the second armor division. They're the ones who make the great drive into Palermo. So when people see the Patton movie and George C. Scott and the guys roll into Palermo and everybody's cheering and everything like that, the unit that took Palermo was Rose's combat command, combat command A of second armor division. And, and he really made his name for himself in Sicily. Second Armored Division was, as a veteran unit, along with Sam Fuller's 1st Infantry Division, was then pulled out and they were sent to England because they were going to be involved in the Normandy invasion. And you know, it, um, did, it didn't hurt that, that Rose was as fanatical about, about dress code as, as Patton was, I'm told. Rose, I, it's amazing. You're exactly right. I mean, the book that I wrote, I've got a few of the pictures, but if you go... If you go in the Army Signal Corps, I mean, I could I could fill a book with pictures. And, and again, Marshall Fogel, the guy who's written uh, this this sort of coffee table book about Morris Rose, he's got a lot of these great pictures in there. The what's Rose the name of the book? I, I want to get that. 
Yeah, Rose was a snappy dresser. I got to tell you, he was a snappy dresser. Uh, he he always went with the high cavalry boots, always polished, um, always would would be properly outfitted. It used to amaze his soldiers; they couldn't figure out how he was doing it because, you know, he was always at the front line. So how in God's name are you getting all this? How are you getting accoutred like this? Most of the rest of us can barely find water to shave, and you've got your boots polished. But he he like Patton believed that especially with the drafty army, citizen soldiers, you had to make them feel like soldiers and started with looking like a soldier. Now to you or I, we may say, well, that, you know, it doesn't matter how they fight. I mean, many good units look like crap in the field, but, but for that army of citizens, many of whom were having their first combat experience, it, it was a way to create morale and discipline. And, um, you know, Rose was unusual in that regard. Mo most commanders were a lot more casual. In fact, his commanders that he worked for, Collins, the Corps commander, Joe Collins, Omar Bradley, were much more casual. When you see pictures of them, they're, they're not decked out. That was seen as a patent thing. Well, Terry Allen looked bedraggled compared. Oh, God, Terry Allen. Well, you've seen his official photos. He, he looks like he just rolled out of bed. I what mean, and Terry Allen was an old cavalryman. Yeah. But Allen was the kind of guy who would argue opposite of Rose and Pat. He'd say, nah, it doesn't matter. As long as their weapons are clean and they're, they're fighting, that's all that matters. Each, you know, the one of the great things, people see the military and they think because everybody's wearing a uniform, they all think alike. There's a lot of individuality in the service. And in World War II, I think one of the strengths of the American military was they gave, they gave opportunities for those individuals. You know, they, they, yes, they were working as a team, but they could use their innovation. And for a fellow like Morris Rose, who had some pretty distinct and, and very important and good ideas about how to employ armor formations, I mean, he was in his element. He was he was let loose and he he was able to do things. You are a retired lieutenant general, correct? Yes. When when you know uh, going through the archives and sifting through all this information and getting a real sense of what um, the 1930s and 40s United States Army was like, the command structure, everything. Um, you served in a different kind of army, but what was similar? Is there is there a constant from there, there from is a constant. There, there's there's really three constants. The first is all militaries going all the way back to recorded history, you know, go back to the Sumerians and the ancient Chinese, they all have some things in common because it's the nature of the business. You know, it's just like everybody who's a plumber essentially deals with water and pipes and all that, whether they're doing it in China or Germany or South Africa, it doesn't matter. Right, right. So, so there's that, there's a commonality from that. The American military, the army in particular, is the most traditional of the services. Some would argue the Navy, but, but I would tell you the Navy is tied to technology. So they, you know, as the technology changes from wooden sailing ships to iron ironclads to, to aircraft carriers or something, you know, they have to evolve. Sure. But the army is very traditional. Infantrymen today are still largely armed with the modern equivalent of what they were carrying at Valley Forge, you know, a hand weapon, and they're walking out there with people shooting at them. And, and the tank had been introduced in World War I, and Americans are very mechanized and all that. But, but the tanks today, you can clearly see the lineage going back to the Sherman and, and, and all that. So um, I found that the, the heritage was similar. The other thing to remember for Rose is, yes, he, he commanded as a general in, a, in an army that was made of draftees and volunteers in World War II. But most of the time he'd served in the army, it had been a volunteer army which is the one I served in. Um, so had they fought a small war in the 20s or 30s, I'm glad they didn't, but had they done so, they would have fought it with volunteers. The school system he went to is identical to one I attended in terms of how you get commissioned. Even to this day, you can be commissioned through West Point, ROTC, or Officer Candidate School, or a direct battlefield commission, which we still do occasionally, you know, because of success in combat. That, that's how Audie Murphy, who was a sergeant in World War II, ends up retiring as a major because he was promoted officer based on being a, a great fighter in World War II. Um, so, so that's the second point. The traditions of the American army aren't that different. It doesn't, you know, in other words, you can see a lot of things that when I'm reading it, it's like, yeah, that's just like now, that's just like now, that's, that's the same. And the third part I think is, is something too, is because I had the opportunity to fight in both Iraq and Afghanistan and command a American forces, and also in, in case, some cases, allied forces in, in both Iraq and Afghanistan, 
because I had that opportunity, um, I know what fighting's like. The different kind of war against terrorists and all that and guerrillas versus fighting German panzer tanks and stuff. But some of it's quite the same. You still got to balance your time. You got to, you know, you're still human. So you got to figure out when you eat and sleep in between, you know, it's great to see these movies or these documentaries where you, they're showing all the fighting, but that general is a 45 or 50 year old man. You know, he's got to get water. He better get some sleep. Sometime he better eat. You know, it would be nice if he could read or write a letter home now and then, because he's a human. I mean, I know, I know the troops when they looked at General Rose many times thought he was like a robot almost because he seemed so driven and with, but even he had to catch that time and do that. Those are things I am familiar with. And, and so I've, I, I looked for that when I looked at Rose. I said, I said, he's division commander. How's he getting all this done? What's he doing? How is he spending his time? And what impressed me about Morris Rose was he spent his time with the soldiers. He realized that, that his personal presence made a difference. It wasn't going to be the written order he issued. It wasn't going to be uh, radio calls from the headquarters. It was going to be, if he thought it was important to get across the Ain River, he was at the Ain River. If he thought it was important to penetrate the West Wall, he's at the West Wall. He's not telling you to do it. He's with there as you, with you, leading you. And that's got to be so inspiring to every rank below his. That is, From I mean, what I can tell, I mean, that's why the guy was respected. He, ter You can see with a general like Terry Allen, the 1st Infantry Division, and later the 104th, he was loved, you know, Terry Allen, every, he was the coach. He was the player coach and everybody loved him. And, and he was a very personal guy. Rose isn't that way. Rose is not, is not Allen that he can be everybody's buddy. And he knew that, but he didn't try to be. What he just did is he says, hey, here's what I'm good at, which is fighting and leading, follow me. And he, ins he inspired people that way. I, I would say the difference between the two is that Allen was, was loved, but Rose was respected. And, and to a degree fear by his own guy, because he was tough. You know, I mean, you, you if you were one of his subordinates you, and you produced, great. But if you didn't, you were going to lose your job. And he wasn't messing around. I guess what I, I meant to also ask the personalities among, um, I guess, the, uh, the Mount Olymp the Olympus of American generals, of people that we know about. Um, and that also leads me to, to uh, comments on no one realizes how many staff officers commanders are relieved after campaigns like in north africa yes i was astonished when reading rick atkinson's book how many people were relieved and where do they go afterwards well right so getting getting relieved military term you know getting fired yes. what we'd say in civilian life people get fired and of course that happens and there's two things that are that occurred in war, and we certainly see it in, in what happened to Third Armor Division with Morris Rose. Some of the people who were fired actually fired themselves. In other words, they would come to their commander and say, look, I can't take it anymore. I mean, and we would say, we would today we understand terms like post-traumatic stress disorder and all that kind of stuff. That wasn't fully understood in World War II. You, you had people like General Patton who just said, well, I reject that. You know, that's not, you're a coward. You're, you're not fighting hard enough. You know, and he's going through hospitals in Sicily slapping guys sure. and stuff. The, the odd thing, by the way, is, and I mean, look, you know, I'm no psychiatrist, but Patton to me, but in the Sicilian campaign was exhibiting some elements of post-traumatic stress disorder himself, you know, and it shouldn't surprise us given that, you know, you spend the entire time at the front, you're getting shot at too. You're seeing people killed, you're killing people, you know, so that, that corrodes your will and character. I heard the best so story. Some people, some people just, they, they left because they couldn't take it anymore. Right. Other people just made mistakes or, or it was seen that they could not handle the situation. Mm -hmm. And so this is not a time to be kind. So they would try to find them a job that was more something they could handle. Maybe the guy, maybe the person couldn't handle frontline combat, but they were pretty good with numbers. So you put them back at the supply depot and they, they sort out all the ammunition or something. So they could still contribute to the war effort. Very rarely did th these people just, quote, go home. And it was a fairness thing because the private couldn't go home. The sergeant and corporal couldn't go home. You know, <laughs> if they're fighting in the third armor division, you know, they, they may have a bad day and they got to go tomorrow again. You know, today's Monday. They got to go on Tuesday. So they, it would have been a fairness issue to send all the colonels and generals home. So instead, they find them jobs in these various headquarters. And, and you see that occasionally. And, and sometimes there were cases of people who got a second chance. So we mentioned Terry Allen. 
Terry Allen was relieved of command of the 1st Infantry Division in Sicily. Omar Bradley, his corps commander at the time and 2nd Corps, relieved him. He thought Allen was just too undisciplined. And at the same time, he relieved Allen's deputy, Brigadier General Teddy Roosevelt, the son of the president. So he fires both of them at once. He said, get out of here. You guys are too undisciplined. You can't control the unit. Both officers got a, a second chance. Teddy Roosevelt lands as a Brigadier General at at Utah Beach on Normandy on June 6, 1944, in the movies played by Henry Fonda, The Longest Day. And he earned the Medal of Honor. He earned it. He went ashore with the lead wave. I mean, he brave as hell. He also, had, he, though, had a bad heart. And um, he was about to take over another division, and he, and he died of a heart attack during the Normandy campaign. So he never took over his division. Allen was given a division stateside to train, the 104th Division, 104th Infantry Division. Allen, who was this ball of fire guy, as we talked about, very personable, he implants his will on this. He trained the 104th, the Timberwolves, they were called. They were trained for night operations, which was very unusual at that time. He'd, he'd come up with this brainstorm. We're going to fight at night. We're going to avoid the German artillery. They won't be able to see us. We'll sneak up, you know, because that back then they had no ground radar or night vision device like we got today. So he comes up with this idea, trains the division in his inimitable style. And in fact, it it would later be that he and Rose would work together during the final attack into the Third Reich when they take the city of Cologne and then and he would be present right in the area when Rose was killed on, on March 30th in 1945. He and Alan- were they, both, were they both in Aachen at the same time? In October? What's that? Were they in Aachen in October of 44? Yeah, yes, but, but the 104th was north of Aachen. They weren't in the city at that time. The 104th was north of Aachen. The 104th, Allen was such a, a character that Eisenhower originally was afraid to assign him under Bradley because he thought Bradley hated him. And Bradley definitely didn't like him. So for a while, they loaned him to Monty. And he was up north with the British. Mm -hmm. You know, um, the 104th was is like an, an American exchange unit or something, you know, to help out the British. And, um, and Bradley finally said, look, you know, it's not personal. He, you know, he's got a good division. We'll take him, you know, no, no issue. But they did avoid each other. I mean, Bradley would never go check on on Allen's unit, and Allen made no secret of the fact that he thought Bradley didn't know what he was doing. Did Allen have a, a, a relationship with Rose that went back to the States, or did he just I, I was trying to find that out. I mean, I, it, it, some of the other works on it, um, Assad in particular, raised that issue because they had coincident time in some cavalry regiments, state, you know, before the, between the wars, and some schooling. But as near as I can tell, they didn't really know each other. And part of the problem is Terry Allen himself. Terry Allen is, was everybody's buddy. So if he met you, he was one of those guys who meet you. It's like people in Hollywood, right? They meet you one time and you're their very best friend, you know? <laughs> and so, but he, he was that way. If he met you, he was their best friend. So he talked about Rose, like Rose and him had been buddies forever. Oh yeah, General Rose, I've known him a long time. Rose is like, who is this? I don't know this. You know, I just met this guy. Wow. Now they did serve together in North Africa and Sicily. So Rose, although he's not working for first, he knew him from theater. I mean, Allen was an outsized personality and everybody knew Terry Allen. So um, he'd been on the cover of time. Exactly. Wow. Well, and again, just, I mean, and remember at one point, his, his deputy, Theodore Roosevelt was the son of Teddy Roosevelt, the president. So, I mean, very famous unit, first infantry division that they were, that they were both with in North Africa and in Sicily. And at that time, there were not many American units fighting in Europe. So, they did get a lot of coverage. Um, so, you know, Alan always said, you know, Rose was my best friend. And Alan was clearly very shook up when Rose got killed. I mean, it, it affected him very much. So, I mean, certainly he saw it that way. Rose is so reserved. I don't know what he thought. I mean, I mean I'm, I'm sure he thought this guy, Alan, is just, you know, he's something else. You know, he's, he's like the anti-Rose in terms of personality, so outgoing and everything. But they clearly respected each other and their units worked well together. I mean, they, you know, obviously in a professional sense, these guys were close and they saw the war the same way in terms of fighting the Germans. When you set out to write Panzer Killers, did you, um, you know, as I read it or as I read it and I really, truly enjoyed it, it moves fast. And I was thinking it moves fast like an armored outfit because you really, if you could explain how, on the go these these troops were i mean i don't even know how long they would stay in a certain town unless they were assaulting it or going around it right but it, it seems like when you set out to write a book like this did you say okay there's been a more uh 
personal uh, biography on Rose, but I want it didn't get into the um, into the uh, the military aspect as much. Is that something that goes on in your head? It, yeah, it, it definitely went in my head. I, I thought to myself because I loved the book by Steve Osset and um, and by Don Miller. Miller. Miller, of course, had been a sergeant and known Rose in the war. He'd served in the division with him, so he he knew him as his division commander and as one of his commanders. So. I knew that they had they had sort of described Rose the man from birth to death. And I said, well, what can I bring to this? Because I'm, I'm fascinated with this story. You know, here's a senior commander, Jewish American, fighting the Nazi Germans in Germany, you know, killed by the SS. I mean, certainly not the only Jewish person who could say that, but, uh, but killed in combat with the SS, you know, basically in personal combat with guys and I mean that is highly unusual for a general to die that way and I said so so how can I tell this story of him and his division from a military perspective mm -hmm. so you ask you know the speed and stuff like this so I the first one of the first things I did there's great archives in the book lists in the back the various archives there are third armor division is very fortunate because their intelligence officer g2 was a guy named lieutenant colonel Andrew Barr he donated the division's papers, a copy of them. Now, some of them had to go to the National Archives and all that. You can find some of them up there. But he donated the, donated the division's papers and all his personal stuff and the stuff of his staff people and everything he could collect from the veterans to the University of Illinois. And it's in the Andrew Barr collection. There. Really? Much of it is, it's all available. There's, there's hundreds of linear feet of photographs, maps, oh I mean, original goodness. documents, and it's all down there. Um, so, but one of the first things I saw, Barr had sort of done a, uh, a summary. Mm -hmm. And it says, and you know what he did? This one page, it's a one pager. It's typed up on probably an old Remington typewriter or something like that. It says, command posts of the 3rd Armored Division, 1944-45. It's like two pages. Every day, this division was moving another 20 miles away, you know, especially in France and then later across in Germany. Mm -hmm. So that told me something. It's like, these guys, as you said, moved a lot. I mean, Again, they were an exploitation unit. They were always put in the main offensives. When they moved, they had to get there quick. Um, the amount of fuel that they consumed, the amount of ammunition, the, the spare parts to keep the trucks and tanks running, just phenomenal amount of work. And, and these, the, you can find stuff in the National Archives again, but the bar, the, this collection is, is unique in terms of sort of the anatomy of a division. And that that's, I think, where, my background is sort of being a, a school trained and experienced army guy. Yeah. You know, I, I could look at that and sort of say, hey, this is interesting. what's going on here. What's going on here? You know, and, and I think some historians might find that very dry. And it could be if you just, you know, if all you did was regurgitate the stats of how many how many tank treads we changed today or whatever. So you got to figure out a way to integrate that, tell that story. And, and I think for me, at least, the bar collection was the big light going on of, oh, here's here's something we can do. And the other. The other authors who've looked at Rose have looked at the bar collection as well, but usually most of the other authors are, are looking from a personal aspect, and there are great personal stories, but, but at least for me, Rose is a figure who's hard to know. I mean, that's what Colin said. He said, you know, I served with the guy through the whole war, and I really didn't know. I, I thought I did, and I did, you know. Are there after-action reports in the bar collection? Yes. Yes, there are. Um, every unit was required at a certain periodic interval. If it was a major operation, like, you know, the Battle of the Bulge or something. They'd write a, a report that covered that whole period while they went down to, into Belgium and then came back up, up near Aachen. But if it was sort of day-to-day -day operations, like when they're in Stahlberg, southeast of Aachen, and they're fighting along the West Wall, it's, it's like every day is just like every other day. It's Groundhog Day. <laughs> They'd be periodic reports. So they might be weekly. They might be daily. Small units would be sent in a daily report. So every company, battery, and troop, you got to love the American Army because they can be disciplined. Every battery company troop every day would send in what they call their morning report. We still do a version of it today. And that says, you know, sort of who's in my unit. You know, I have 130 people assigned. These three people were got sick. These four people were wounded. These two people, unfortunately, were killed. You know, all that. Who got promoted? I moved the, the platoon leader. The lieutenant from first platoon has moved up to be the company executive officer. And it's like a daily snapshot. So, sure. so what I found myself doing, again, probably shows that I guess I got trained well at Fort Leavenworth and commanded general staff college or whatever. But I, I found myself on the floor, I laid out these things and I was making like big spreadsheets of, you know, okay, here's the second battalion, 33rd armor. Here's all their commanders. 
here's their casualties. And, and at one point, you know, I, I actually have lists of the individual casualties by name wow. because it told me something. You could see when you'd see these spots where a unit would take a lot of casualties and you know, okay, they were clearly leading that attack. You know, they were involved in that. Um, the one thing that came through very clearly was the infantry regiment, the, the half-track infantry regiment, the 36th infantry regiment. They were always involved in everything because there were two armor regiments. But there was only one infantry regiment. So you always had to have them. And, and they took a lot of casualties, sadly. But, but I mean, they were important to the fight. There was one story that, and I really, I, I've lost touch with this man in San Diego, Ed Schloss, he was a wonderful guy. And I remember telling um, Steve Osad and, and, and Don, what was his last name? Um, Marsh. Marsh, I remember, you know, I said, I've got two hours of interview, you know, with, with uh, Schloss, who was there. He said he was the last person to see Rose. And, and then I got a response saying, everyone claimed to have seen Rose before. Uh, no, Steve and Don are exactly right. I saw the same phenomenon. Right, I mean, right. I was it, the last one to see. Yeah. Yeah, I, I everybody said told. that. Uh, to me, one of the more fascinating, and it just shows sort of things that can happen in war. Um, and this, unfortunately, because of my own experience, I have seen things like this. Um, when Rose was killed by the Germans that night on the road, they didn't even realize they'd killed a general. He was wearing his insignia and everything, but it was dark. They were trying to get away from American tanks. Um, they were moving. Everybody was moving. And after they shot Rose, and I'm convinced they shot him because he was standing in the middle of the three guys and he was the tallest. That's why they shot him. He was the easiest target to hit. I mean, because a burp gun, what the German used, the German tank commander that shot him, that's very inaccurate, but he managed to hit him with multiple rounds. So you, wow. this is close. I mean, it's, it's a few feet. And, um, but they never realized it was Rose. Even, even worse, I mean, although at this point in the war, I mean, discipline has sort of gone out the window for the German army, let alone the SS. I mean, we're just doing fanatic crazy stuff. Um, they never even, they didn't check the radio truck that was there. They captured the guys on it, but they didn't even take the codes or any of that stuff, which would, you know, Six months earlier, that would have all been done. The Germans would have methodically stripped everything. Yeah. But at this point in the war, no. So when they found, you know, when the patrol found Rose the next morning, and we do have their report from the 83rd Recon, the guys who went forward to get him, um, you know, they found his helmet there, his map case. I mean, everything was there. They, they hadn't even they hadn't even touched his body since he'd been killed. This is Paderborn, correct? Yes, Pat just south of Paderborn. Where in Germany is that? Where is that? Paderborn is just across the Rhine, just east of the Rhine, maybe about 85 miles east of the Rhine. And it's at the eastern terminus of the Ruhr Basin industrial area. So if you think of the Ruhr Basin as being like a football, Paderborn would be one of the pointed ends of the football, you know, east-west. So it, it was important because, and reason Rose was determined to get there, if he got there, his old outfit, the Second Armor Division, was driving from the north. And the goal was to link up. And once they did that, they would have bagged all. There was a German army group defending the Ruhr. They would have cut them off from everything. Yeah. And in fact, that did happen. And, and the Ruhr pocket was later named the Rose Pocket, you know, in commemoration of, of Morris Rose. I mean, didn't do much good for Rose or his family, but it was a nice gesture. I mean, it was appreciated by the. And there were, what, eight weeks left in the war when he went? Yeah. Oh, yeah, March 30th, he's killed on March 30th. The war ends with the German surrender on, on May 8th. So I mean, that it's very close, very close to the end of the war. I, again, the, in the same way, and I know I keep bringing up Terry Allen, but you know, it's, it's the strangest thing because I equally had a fascination or have one with, with Rose because I'd heard these names, especially sure. being Jewish um, from a very young age. And, but I remember reading, um, I think his name was Magnuson. You could, you talk about him in the book. He right, was, right, yeah, exactly. And he wrote this little piece called The General Cried at Dawn because he, right. was, he was with Terry Allen when they heard that. He, he was the third armored division liaison officer. So one of the things units do when they're fighting near each other. So 104th Infantry Division with Allen, Rose's third armored division were working together. They were, units were changing, you know, exchanging information. They were, Sometimes units were attached or cross-attached. They were supplying fuel and ammunition to each other. So Magnuson was, was the liaison. He was Rose's representative in Allen's headquarters. And he was there and he was present when, when Allen found out about it. And um, 
Yeah. I mean, it's hard to imagine what these guys would have been thinking. I mean, you know, at this point in the war, Allen's been through a lot at this point. I mean, he's, he's commanded since North Africa, as had Rose. I mean, these guys were there for the whole war. They didn't miss anything. Everything an American person could do in the war against the Germans, they get in on. Mm. And so, you know, I'm sure, I, and again, Allen's this outgoing um, sort of, you know, everything's in the store window with him. So if he's emotionally affected, you're going to know it. And it clearly affected the liaison officer magazine. I mean, he, he, he did not expect that. When you were, uh, when were you at the war college and explain, I was, I like I was in the war college, 97 to 98 at Carlisle, Pennsylvania. What is it? Cause that's a great honor. And to, to, to go to the war college, could you explain what that is? And, yes. and then tell me what, how much, obviously this has been a lifelong, uh, um, fascination of yours, you know, with, with, generals and commanders that preceded you. And you obviously learn about that stuff at the war college and sure. through, your own, uh, through your own research. But how, and then you could explain like when you are, you yourself are called to command troops in, in the field. And, you know, as you did in, in Iraq and Afghanistan, are you mindful of, of, of your predecessors when you're in situations? Yeah, I, I'll start with your last comment. Yes, I try to be, I, you know, because I think we can look back at the people who did it before us and you can learn from their experiences. And, you know, look, even the most successful ones, even the people like General Rose, some things don't go right for them. You know, they have a problem. You know, war is by its nature, if you're, if you're fighting a dangerous enemy like the Nazi Germans in World War II, they're going to have their days where they're going to get you. And it's how you deal with that, that that always interested me. You know, how do you get around that? The fact that you have a rough time at the West Wall, but yet you've got to react and get down and stop the Ardennes counteroffensive right. in the Battle of Bulls. So, so places like the War College, one, one of the reasons they're important, uh, the way to think of it is arm, it's Army graduate school. Right. So you know how if, if people are fortunate enough to go to college, at some point they may go to graduate school. Well, one of the things you want to always do at graduate school is step back from your current professional life and think a bit. Because we tend to we tend to do, and boy, if you talk about doers, the military is full of doers. I mean, it's all do, 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 very little thinking. I think some of Rose's mental reserve and the fact that he didn't have a lot to say a lot of times, it, it was he, he was thinking. He was using what time he had to think ahead, to, you know, to play chess, not checkers on that battlefield in Europe. And a lot of people don't do that. They get caught up in the day of the day. So the war college is a way to pull people like me and, and the other men and women in the military, pull them out of line units for a while and say, okay, you were commanded troops, take a year off. We're going to study history. We're going to study military strategy. We're going to study, we're going to hear from speakers. So, you know, you'd have the, the chief of the staff of, of the British army come or the commander of the Japanese self-defense force ground force, you know, all these different people would come and give you their perspective. You know, the chief of naval operations, sometimes political leaders as well, you know, Secretary of Defense comes and speaks to the War College all the time, Secretary of State. Um, but the idea is to give you this time to think and to write about it and all that. So in my case, you, you correctly identified, uh, I have been, since a young age, fascinated with this idea of combat leadership. And there's a, there's a dynamic that's been going on, not just in the American Army, but in militaries worldwide, starting around the time of World War I. And it's this whole thing about what's the commander's job. There's a school that says, once you get to the war of millions in World War I, the commander has no role at the front line. The commander should go to a bunker, connect up the telephone or the internet or whatever it is, and watch the whole thing today be on screens in those days, map sheet or whatever. There was a counter view and guys who believed it were guys like George Patton, Morris Rose, Erwin Rommel for the Germans, Montgomery for the British. So even though he sometimes gets a bad rap, even in my book, he certainly did not deserve a bad rap for saying he wasn't a frontline commander. He got up and saw what was going on. And this was this idea that modern technology can free you as a commander to not sit in the command post, what I would today call the digital chateau, but to actually go as far forward as you can, spend your time there and use that modern technology to still communicate your will back to the unit. In World War II, that was being done by radio. And that's what Rose did. That's that's why Rose would bring his jeep forward, his peep, as he called it. That's what the tankers and cavalry guys always called a jeep was a peep. They had to be different, you know. Right. But right. Um, he'd bring that forward, and the main thing on it was the radio. 
you know, he, he didn't mind walking around or riding a tank. He'd do all those things. But what, what was important about the Rose command people is the radio, because that's what allowed him to command the division, no matter where he was at. And so he had a much clearer view because he had, he had this, and this is talent that Rose had. I don't, I don't know that I had it. it probably if I did, I would have been done a better job as a general, but he had it. And he had this ability to, he could see where the fight was going to be and he'd be there and he'd be there to feed in the units. He did a brilliant job of this on the Northern shoulder, the battle of the bulge. I mean, it basically he individually was feeding in tank companies and battalions and, and half track units and artillery and engineers to stop these German attacks. I mean, at one point, the Third Armor Division, you know, was battling like four German divisions at once with about a third of the Third Armor Division strength. But what was making it work was Rose wasn't just sitting there. He was attacking them. They had no idea how big the force was of Americans. They thought it was much larger because Rose was a step ahead of them. And, um, but that came, I think, from thinking, you know, he, he was able to think. He was, you know, we always say this when we watch sports or something, you know, how we can see some some players who just seem to hack through the game and they just struggle with it, but others, no matter what they're doing, they always seem to look back and see the whole field, see the whole play develop and all that. And Rose was one of those guys. He could do that. Now, what's your, what's your life like been since retirement? And, and, oh, uh, and how, I, um, how has your experience teach. informed your being as, as a writer and an author? Yeah, I get, I, I write as you as mentioned, and that's, I think that's important to try and, you know, because I'm, I'm trying to learn more about what I experienced through learning other things. So, you know, trying to make some sense out of it all and, and all that. And then I teach. I teach um, college at North Carolina State University. And that's interesting, too, because um, to translate, I teach military history, Russian history, Cold War stuff, all that, you know. And, and for this generation that I'm teaching now, the Cold War is history. I might, I might as well be talking about the Babylonians or something. I mean, it's, it's ancient news to them, although I try and show them how much of it is still very relevant. Right. But, um, but when I cover, for example, uh, you know, the era of Napoleon or something like that, I try to explain it in such a way that they can understand it. And I think it helps that I've had some actual combat experience myself, so I can cut through some of the shenanigans you get in a lot of popular histories. I mean, yes, it's very nice to show a map of the Battle of Waterloo, but no one at the Battle of Waterloo had a dirigible or a helicopter to get up and see both sets of lines and the troop. Nobody had that view. Right. Constant smoke drifting across the battlefield, glimpses, bits and pieces of noise, movement in the woods to this side. Hey, I think that's our horses coming up. Wait, they're in the Prussian uniform. It's not our guy. You know, that kind of confusion I'm very familiar with. Mm -hmm. and, and you can sort of, it, it's it allows me to explain to the students what it may have been like to fight in, in a medieval battle or to fight in a, in this. And of course, the, the most important thing I tell them is that, is that although the American entertainment industry does a beautiful job of recreating the pictorials of war. In other words, if you watch a modern high budget movie, a modern high budget video game, miniseries, whatever it is, the pictorial will match what you'd see in the museum. I mean, everybody's properly dressed. They, they behave right. You know, the ships look right. The planes look right, all that kind of stuff. But the behaviors, you know, sadly, if you were to, to pick World War II in a movie, for most of the film, you wouldn't see anybody. You'd see smoke drifting around and you, you, you'd hear muffled noises and people crawling around. You know, it, it would be the most boring movie in the world, you know? except for a few isolated incidents. And obviously that doesn't make for a good drama, but right, uh, right, right. But, but for my students, they think, they think war is the call of duty video game. You see your enemies, um, you pick your weapon, you shoot them. And it's like, I, I always tell them, Hey, it's not like that. And moreover, this concept that you're going to shoot a person face, face to face and just go keep doing that. And it's not going to affect you. If you're a psychopath, that's true. But most right. humans, thank God are not psychopaths. And it will deeply affect you the more and more you're forced to do that. And I think that's a big contributor to post-traumatic stress disorder. Sure. Did you, did you consider yourself one of those quote unquote soldiers generals? Were you concerned with what, what your uh, non-coms and what, what men they were commanding? Yes, I, I did. I, did, I tried. I, I, I was a person, as you can probably gather from the book that I read, wrote and all that, I did not spend time at the headquarters. I was always forward doing stuff. And I think it was particularly important in Iraq and Afghanistan because those, those fights are small unit fights. I mean, you know, in other words, it's, it's 10 Americans and, and a few Iraqis or Afghans 
duking it out with, you know, 10 insurgents in a, in a, you know, in a cotton field or something like that. I mean, that's what it's like. And, uh, and so I tried to be at that location as, as much as I could, because I thought it, it enabled me to understand what the soldiers at the front were going through. And also gave me clarity when I go have to make decisions or whatever, I could say, now, wait a minute, this doesn't really work. You know, we're, we're, we're issuing an order here that's unexecutable. We can't be doing that, you know. Have so, you ever run into any of your men just randomly in the streets on vacation somewhere where someone will look at you and say, are you Oh, you mean since I got out? Yeah. Yeah, all the time. North, North Carolina in particular has wow. a lot of people here. We, we have a lot of big installations here. Fort Bragg is just down the street. Seymour Johnson Air Base. Oh, yeah. And as I got more senior, I, I worked with all the services. I, I've run into people from um, from foreign militaries that that I, I've known, you know. But wow. yeah, uh, my my children joke about it. They they always say, "Oh, Dad, you know somebody everywhere we go." It's not because I'm some great guy or anything. It's just I was in long enough that that I was in positions where I, I met a lot of people. Maybe you are a great guy, but you're playing it down because you're a modest guy. No, I know I have a lot to be modest about. So okay. trust me, I, I know that I know the difference. No, because I'm crazy about you already. We've been talking about an hour. You know, I could listen to you uh, tell stories for a while. But I, you know, I want people to buy the book first and foremost. But I uh, really am grateful and, and truly honored to have uh, been able to talk to you today. No, and, it's great to talk to you, Steve. And you're yeah. you're so knowledgeable about Rose and the the ish, the you know, the, the era he lived in. I mean, that's well, really good. I, I, well, thank you. I just, I'm, uh, was always drawn to that era and, and having had the opportunity to interview uh, men that had fought with him. Yeah. Specifically one man, but I guess I'll leave you with this, this anecdote. He told, his wife told me um, that when they went to Denver sometime in the sixties, they, they, wanted to go visit the, the hospital named sure Ed. yeah named for the general right yeah and she told me that when ed uh walked in she was a little behind him and he saw the picture of him and he snapped and he saluted and she right. said wow it was like a real you know automatic kind of response and that gave me sort of a that gave me the idea of what he must have felt you know like right. just in his presence you know then and and now, but or in in back in the seventies, but still, it, it it gave me pause, as they say. Yeah, it, it is a reminder that there's when you talk about big human events like World War II, obviously a very big one. There's so many stories tied to it, and so many experiences. You know, the good news is we can always learn more about it. The bad news that I really worry about is that today we've got so few World War II veterans left with us. And we're going to lose some of those all forever when those people pass on. It's, yeah, I wish we didn't, but, but I, do, I do know that's happening. Wow. So maybe you could give uh, Third Armored Division tours. In... <laughs> yeah. Who knows? You never I'll be know. the first to sign up. I'm not, I'm not kidding. I'll let you know if we go to that route. But, we'll, uh, we'll, stay, we'll stay in touch. Are you working on anything right now? Or are you just enjoying uh, the I am, Well, I'm mainly working on um, Panzer Killers and the various uh, public things related to that, you know, right. some, some other events like this. Um, and then I think for the future, I, I don't know, I may do something else with uh, World War II. I've been looking at some things having to do with the airborne forces. I, I do have a background in that area as well. So um, possibly do something with the 82nd Airborne or something, right. we'll see. Yeah, there's, a, I have a lot of questions about that that we could talk about off campus. Oh yeah, well, there, that, me too. And I, yeah. that's it's sort of like this, I figured if I've got questions, maybe readers will too, and maybe we can learn together. Yeah, well, I'm, uh... Have a great rest of the day. It's Monday and uh, the rest of the week, and I'll, I'll, I'll send you a link. Thank you very much. Yeah, great to talk great. to you, Steve. Great to see we'll, you. We'll talk very soon, okay? Okay, great. Thank you so much. Take care. Yeah, my, my pleasure. Thanks. Bye-bye.